here today to talk about um, debunking conspiracy theories. Um, and as you know, I'm uh, <laughs> uh, calling in from Venice. It's actually my birthday today as well, from me enough. Um, I, I should I should say this isn't part of the lying bit. I, I've even got proof. Look, it's see, I've got, I've got my birthday cards, so I'm having a great day. Um, <laughs> and this this just uh, this just like make you know, makes makes my day really to do this. Um, and obviously, my name is Joe. By the way, that's not the lie either. So just to kind of get these things out of the way. Um, so anyway, um, today we're going to be talking about debunking conspiracy theories and. Um, just a little bit, if you haven't heard of full fact before as well, we, um, we've, been, we've been dealing with conspiracy theories and many other forms of misinformation for the last 10 years now. Um, I, say, I keep saying 10 years and I, I need to update that. It's 12 years now because it, it's 2010 is when we started. So we've been actually been going for 12 years now. Um, and um, oh, this, this still says 11 years. It's, I need to round everything up. <laughs> um, and um, in that time, um, what I will say is that um, when we talk about the conspiracy beliefs that we've encountered, it's far from the majority of what we do. The majority of what we cover in the UK is what we would call mainstream misinformation, which takes on a different character to what we might call a conspiracy belief, a conspiracy theory. And it, it has different characteristics, the people who spread it and the way in which it is spread um, look different. And that's one of the things that I'll be able to, 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 to go through with you today. Um, I will say, um, as part of housekeeping, I'll do my best to keep, a, keep an eye on the chat as we go. And if you have questions that I spot, I'll try and answer them on the spot for you. But forgive me if I do miss them, because uh, the, the, it might be difficult to see two things at once on my screen. So there'll be a chance for questions at the end as well, if, if you have any more for me. Um, so let's just start with the obvious question, because we might have very, very slightly things in our heads when we talk about conspiracy theories, and it would, it would, it would help to get on the same page, first of all, as to what we're talking about. Uh, the, the moon landing was faked is perhaps one of the most, uh, most well-known theories that is held by some people that it, that it didn't actually happen in 1969. There are actually a number of studies that measure prevalence. And in this country, probably the most prevalent thing that is considered a conspiracy theory surrounds the death of Princess Diana in, in 1997 uh, or eight. I, I, I forget uh, so long ago now. But, um, and that can take on a mul multiple forms. It can take on the form that Princess Diana's death was staged or that it was um, deliberately arranged by um, some shadowy organization or the royal family itself even. Um, so it can take on different forms, but that whole, that whole subject, that very emotive public event, now 20, um, yeah, 20 years old, more than 20 years old, still evokes those theories that, um, that people aren't happy about. And as we'll be discussing, part of the reasons that those theories take hold comes because of gaps in information that we have about these events, the natural things that we just, we don't know how something so terrible could have happened. Maybe that means that there's something more to it. And that's sometimes where these beliefs can take hold. But in terms of looking at some general definitions of conspiracy beliefs, um, we, we've commissioned some research in the last few years as a charity looking at um, basically where do these beliefs come from, what forms do they take in the UK. Um, we settle on this definition uh, of conspiracy theories. Attempts to explain the causes of significant social and political events with unsubstantiated claims of secret plots organ orchestrated by powerful actors. So there's some key words here. Um, actually, the first key word is significant. Um, conspiracy theories rarely center or fester around everyday activities. They center around significant events, such as the coronavirus pandemic, such as that Diana, uh, Princess Diana's death that I mentioned, and such as the moon landings back in 1969. They center around significant events because they have the world's attention and because there's a very there's almost like a macro culture behind these theories. They, they are there around these big events because 
they are based on very grandiose ideas of of you know the powers that be that are, are behind them and that are orchestrating them unsubstantiated is important for, for them to be called this they have to be without substantiation if there is are even modicums of truthful evidence of them, they might need to be treated in a different way. Um, and unsubstantiated, by the way, is different to a complete lack of information. Quite often, um, there is very cogent contrary information um, to a conspiracy theory to suggest it isn't actually true. So it's not, it, don't think of this as a complete information vacuum where claims like this simply can't be proved by anyone. It isn't an information vacuum. It's a mostly contrary information and unsubstantiated versions peddled by some on the other side. And then secret plots orchestrated by powerful actors. Secrecy is important to many conspiracy theories because there has to be an element of non-falsifiability. So unfalsifiable claims because they reject publicly available evidence bases from the start. So this is why it can be a real challenge to fact check these, because all the sources that we rely on as fact checkers, they tend to be publicly available, trusted sources of information. And this kind of flies in the face of that. Once people cast away the same sources of information, it's very difficult to even have a conversation with someone on that kind of level. And we've been doing this for 12 years, so we know a lot about how to judge whether a source is trustworthy or not <coughs> in UK public debate. And I totally agree. I think if you can't share, if you don't have a shared understanding of what a source is with somebody else, then it's very difficult to even start a political debate, let alone a work out whether what each other is saying is true. Finally, at their worst, uh, conspiracy theories can cause harm um, and they can cause very serious harm to health, finances, and to democracy by sowing mistrust in all forms of authority. Now we've done um, we've done some um, we've done some um, research on this ourselves when we look at types of harm. So, at full fact, we define four key types of harm that we look at. Excuse me. Uh, oops, <laughs> lost my place there. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about types of harm, um, we talk about basically four different types. So from the starting point of no harm, when people simply get things wrong online, disengagement from democracy, followed by interference in democracy, economic harm, and finally a risk to life. So when we talk about disengagement from democracy, we're essentially talking about the very generally low level, but ne definitely prevalent um, phenomena that happens when simply people accept a cult culture of politicians lying or spreading misinformation. And it causes disengagement, it can cause apathy, and that can, that can assist abuse of power. Because if people, for instance, aren't actually going out to vote, then that enables people in positions of power who can maybe exploit that and exploit it at the expense of opponents who are dealing in, in better information. Interference in democracy, well, we've, we've seen this very, very vi vividly um, in, recent, in recent elections in multiple countries. Um, in um, <clears throat> the 2020 US election, um, huge, um, huge claims being spread that the fundamental way that an election was conducted was fraudulent, for instance, um, and claims by the Donald Trump campaign that they actually won the election and that it was rigged and stolen from the, by the Biden camp. Um, so actual interference in democracy is a, is a potential harm. It can actually potentially attempt to upend legitimate democratic processes. Economic harm. So can legitimate companies be damaged, brought down by misinformation? And finally, a risk to life. And we've seen this very much vividly in the coronavirus pandemic, because now 
when we started out as a fact-checking organization 12 years ago, we were dealing mainly in claims about is unemployment this or that, is, is immigration going up or down in the UK? And now we're dealing with claims that vaccines can kill you if you inject them into your body or that they'll kill your unborn baby as a pregnant mother. And when claims reach that level, they reach the kind of very, the very highest possible level of harm. And you realize there's actually a really cogent connection between this information being spread and believed and people losing their life or having complete, having their lives destroyed. Um, and this is why as, a, as an organization now, we have a motto, we say misinformation destroys lives because that's exactly what it can do. So we've been looking at these types of harm for a number of years. And if anything, I would say nowadays, we're seeing much more of the high level harms um, and certainly at the, the very forefront of public consciousness. So let me just handle, handle back. How prevalent are conspiracy theories? Well, um, there are there is research out there about this. Um, and one very pe large piece of research that YouGov did um, an, a couple of years ago um, focused on, on um, vaccines, because at the moment they're obviously a, a very at that highest level of potential public harm. To what extent, if at all, do you think the following statement is true or false? Vaccines have harmful effects which are not being fully disclosed to the public. Um, and this, this field work took place even before the, 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 the pandemic. Um, uh, roughly all age groups, around 70%, 60 to 70% of people think that that is probably definitely false. So it's probably transparent, they're probably okay. But the proportion of people who think it's probably or definitely true that there's harmful effects not being fully disclosed, um, about 20%, so about one in five adults questioned um, have that belief. Now, the wording of questions really matters in these cases. Um, that's actually a, a fairly, uh, that's a relatively neutrally worded question compared to others we've looked at. Um, an example of a different question that gets at a similar thing would be um, that the harmful effects of vaccines are being deliberately withheld from the public. Do you agree or disagree? So if you take that kind of wording, the proportions of people who probably are definitely agree with that drop quite a lot. Um, so part of it is just, it's, it's very much speaking more to the language of a conspiracy theory, first of all, deliberately being withheld possibly naming an actor that might do it. Governments are deliberately withholding information from the public, really speaks to that. Simply saying vaccines have harmful effects which are not being fully disclosed, it takes it away from the actor and it takes the act of deceit out of the direct statement and puts it to the background. So you could argue either way whether you think answering probably or definitely true to this question constitutes belief in a conspiracy theory? Um, possibly not. Possibly this is the mildest form you could think of, or one of the mildest forms of detection. Nevertheless, one in five people, according to this kind of study, uh, believe that there is something to that statement. And it's worth thinking about what you would, what you would think about this as well, if, uh, if it occurred to you. Um, now, um, at this stage, I've got just a little question for you at this point in the presentation. Um, I'd like you to ask you, when is my birthday? Can any of you uh, tell me when my birthday is? And feel free to chat, or if you're brave enough, come on to speaker and say, but when is my birthday? Today, a, th a few of you have said today. Ah, I, yes, I did say it was today, Ian. Um, but I also said at the start of the presentation that I would lie at some point, possibly more than once. Now, <laughs> yes, it is, it is true. I didn't tell you how, I, I did tell you how much, I uh, uh, didn't tell you how old I was. 
Well, I did say it wasn't an I. I did say it wasn't a lie, but I didn't say at the start of the presentation, oh, by the way, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make it clear when I'm not lying and when I am. I just said at some point I will lie possibly more than once. So the fact that I told you it wasn't a lie, that was a lie as well. <laughs> so I basically tried to reassure you, this isn't the lie, by the way, and then I told you a lie. And I even showed you a birthday card I just got this a couple of days ago. My actual birthday was, was on Monday, on Valentine's Day, which, by the way, is a terrible day to have a birthday. You never, <laughs> it's just all my life I've been com competing with booked restaurants and everything. So all I had to do was take this from a few days ago, show it to you, brandish this kind of fake evidence that it was my birthday, and give you this reassurance that, by the way, that's not a lie. Now, <laughs> obviously, I'm sure this upsets a few of you because why should a fact checker be lying at me? But the reason that I'm doing the exercise is because part of what allows conspiracy theories and others to hold is when people either are not sufficiently open-minded or not sufficiently vigilant when they come across new information. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you were surprised by the fact it wasn't my birthday that that you would therefore be susceptible to believing in some of the theories that we talk about. But what I want you to do with exercises like this is to examine on a scale of say one to 10, how surprised were you that it's not my birthday, given those reassurances I gave you? Um, and how, how vigilant, ah, here we go. <laughs> so a few of you are very surprised, a few of you not, I see, I see a couple of twos. So some of you have, um, some of you have, built up those those walls of vigilance where you're thinking no that challenge is still alive it could still be it's, it, it could still be a thing even though he's telling me it's not a lie um and if you did let your guard down just because i gave you those reassurances then just reflect on that reflect on whether there are situations outside of this extremely contrived presentation where you are more susceptible than you might be otherwise. We all have moments in the day where we're more or less engaged analytically in our minds. Um, and often the, the least uh, engaged parts of the day can be when we're reading the news and reacting to it. So it's worth reflecting when are when are you at your on your most on your most guard and when are you on your least guard and work out okay is that something I need to be concerned about? And am I consuming important information when my guard is relatively low or when my vigilance is low? <laughs> um, I, I'm just seeing, I'm seeing some more messages. So well done, Elizabeth, for rethinking. Um, <laughs> and yes, true, nobody cares about where my birthday is. So that's, that's very true, Ruth. <laughs> But I, I wouldn't want to use a real example anyway, because I don't want to access outside information you might already have or beliefs you already have. Um, but anyway, that was just a little, a little, uh, a little taste in, uh, in what it's like to be vigilant and then to have that vigilance potentially um, thrown back at you and say, OK, did you keep it up as long as you thought you would? Um, so keep that in mind anyway. and. Let's look a little bit more about the reasons behind why people might hold theories. And this goes back to the research that we did as a charity uh, during the pandemic, when we tried to work out, OK, who are the people that hold them? Why do they come into being? And what we did was we did a literature review of a number of studies, mainly UK and US based, um, and um, uh, some based internationally in a number of different countries. But that is, is actually one of the caveats to everything we know about conspiracy theories is that research studies are heavily centered in the global north. Global south account for still a very small amount of direct research into how people consume news media, how, those, how that translates into conspiracy beliefs. So we are limited in what we can say on a general basis about the whole world. But we do know a number of things about um, Western advanced Western democracies, for instance, that we can share, we can share those insights. So why do people hold conspiracy beliefs? Well, the first reason that we've uncovered in research is the comfort, comfort that comes through knowing. 
it can be very uncomfortable, sometimes quite frightening, um, when there are gaps in information about what we know. Go back to the case of Princess Diana, very tragic, very harrowing events that affected a, a whole nation, um, really. I, I don't think that's too much of an exaggeration to say. And when, uh, when events like that happen that are so emotive, that we don't have all the answers to, like how could this have, how how could this have, how could this have transpired? How did we allow this to happen? Sometimes it gives people comfort to think, well, it can't just have been an accident. There must have been something, something behind this, because it's almost more comfortable to think, oh, that couldn't possibly happen to someone else, could it? Surely it has to have been de deliberate. Sometimes that can give people comfort as opposed to thinking things are just random events or accidents that happen tragically um, as a result of this, this, this chase or that that's happening away from the press. So conspiracy beliefs can be comforting. They can explain socioeconomic di disadvantage. And what we've seen in literature is this could be termed as um, who are political winners and political losers, as well as those who are who are relative doing very well in terms of income and wealth and those who are not doing so well. Explaining socioeconomic disadvantage um, can be a way of people saying, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not doing so well, people like me aren't doing so well, and there's no way we can do well because it's a revolving door at the top. There's no way that any of us can get in to those higher socioeconomic classes because there's a conspiracy above us to stop it from happening. There are people who will always be in power and always try and keep the poor people poor, the little people, a bit that way. Um, it brings about a positive sense of self to some of the people that hold them. And related to that, it allows for a kind of collective narcissism. Now, what do I mean by collective narcissism? Well, there's an explanation in the research for this. Collective narcissism is a form of in-group positivity that reflects a belief in the group's greatness and a, a feeling of underappreciation. Simply feeling good about one's community is not narcissistic in and of itself. Collective narcissism derives from the feeling of under-recognition by others. So it's not just about me and me not doing well. Why are we as a group not doing well? It's not simply because well, factors are against us, and that's just life. It's that some other group, those in power or the majority race or in ethnicity, are deliberately just underappreciating us, maybe deliberately trying to keep us down. So the collective narcissism that comes through, that feeds back into explaining socioeconomic disadvantage. So why are we not doing well? Well, it's no fault of our own. It's other people's problem for not recognizing us. Now, it's worth saying at all these times that putting these in the category of what can drive conspiracy beliefs in no way means that it is wrong to believe that you are relatively ignored when it comes to government policy, when it comes to civil society. It's absolutely no reflection on having that kind of belief. What this is showing is people who habitually or instinctively have a mindset in this way or believe, believe these kind of things, live in these groups and visit these kind of forums, what they post, what they say. Studies have shown that this is a phenomenon that is more likely to occur among conspiracy supporters. It doesn't make the actual components of those beliefs, particularly the about social economic disadvantage, doesn't make them invalid. Um, it just means that we can see a correlation in, in, how, in how those beliefs are related um, to holding a conspiracy belief. S related to um, what is it that drives those beliefs is what do we know about people who, like in the Yugov study, people who respond, yes, I believe this, or yes, I believe that. Um, well, we know that Broadly speaking, they show lower levels of analytical thinking. When also given tasks that measure some kind of an analytical skill or critical thinking, 
in these studies, those people who are more likely to say that they believe a conspiracy belief are less likely to have scored well on an analytical thinking exercise. They are likely to have had fewer educational qualifications. They are likely to have a higher need for cognitive closure. Um, this is essentially the need to have no gaps in one's knowledge or one's understanding of an event. So if there are gaps to be filled, some people either accept that there's things that we don't know and that those gaps must exist, but other people may seek at all costs to fill those gaps to close to close that that sense of okay now i know what's going on nothing's being held away from me a tendency to see patterns in events and a tendency to believe things happen for a reason not just randomly and we can see that again going back to the example of of of, of princess diana for instance looking at okay um well is this similar to what happened to John F. Kennedy, for instance, he was assassinated. There are conspiracy theories about him and whether that was an orchestrated, an orchestrated uh, death. So, again, people seeing patterns or um, and more recently, actually, patterns between coronavirus and other existing conspiracy theories, like the theory that 5G causes causes cancer or causes health problems. Examples which I'll be able to go into further very shortly. So we've looked at that. Now, um, as a little resource, which you can either do now um, if you want to, or, or, or later on after this, you can do your own test of how much or little you support conspiracy theories. I'm going to post it into the chat now, the same link, so that you have something to click on if you want to. Um, what this website takes you to is something called the um, I always forget what this acronym is called. <laughs> this acronym is the, the Generic Conspiracist Beliefs Scale, pardon me, the GCBS. And it was created um, basically for use it by researching companies in measuring conspiracy beliefs. So what people basically needed was a metric to decide on a scale of one to five in this case, how much of a conspiracy believer is a person and they do this via a set of gen generic questions um, you may already already be looking at it yourself but if you don't then these are the questions that it will face you with and it will give you five options so you can ask yourself for instance do you agree or disagree with the following uh, the government is involved in the murder of innocent citizens and or well-known public figures and keeps this a secret disagree neutral agree um, uh, as further down, evidence of alien contact is being concealed from the public, for example. Um, groups of scientists manipulate, fabricate or suppress evidence <coughs> in order to deceive the public. Now, you might, you might have a, a relatively high view of yourself and think you're just going to blankly blanket disagree with everything in that list. And of course, in actual studies, sometimes this list can be provided in a, in a rather less obvious way. So these questions can be interspersed with control questions, for instance, that make it a little less obvious what the exercise is about. So it's not a kind of research environment that you'd be doing this, doing this questionnaire in. Nevertheless, this is what's used to screen uh, people. And it's one of the many scales, actually, there are several others, but this is probably the most commonly used in research studies. I did this earlier, actually, myself, and um, I tried to be honest with myself and think, OK, do I completely disagree with the statement or not? Uh, and, and do I is, is there any element to this that I can maybe say, well, there's something to this. It's not it's not something I'll just blandly agree with, but there's something to it. And if you're honest with yourself, you might find yourself, well, not going for the left column all the time. Um, maybe in some cases going for the right column because you have reason to believe that those specific claims are true. Either way, your answer to this question go into five categories and you're rated one out on a scale of one to five on your belief in government malfeasance, in malevolent global conspiracies, control of information being manipulated and so forth, extraterrestrial cover-up um, so that aliens have their own category, 
and personal well-being. <coughs> so concealed dangers such as such as 5G masks, for instance, um, causing people, uh, causing illness amongst people. So you can do this test and get a score for yourself. And maybe that will tell you a little bit about where, if you do have some of these beliefs, where they fall thematically. Um, and that, that could be an interesting thing in and of itself for you to look at further. Um, so this is a kind of example of uh, out there in the world. Um, uh, and Sorry, pardon me. Um, this is an example of out there in the world, how people are, are tested for these kind of beliefs. Now, again, it's worth saying that just because if you do end up clicking um, agree on quite a lot of them um, doesn't make you mad certainly it doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist this is just an instrument that is used to try and screen people for it you might for instance have as i think i saw in one person on the chat you might have you might have difficulties trusting um the government and official sources and to be honest there are very legitimate reasons for distrusting official information um, in some senses. We see that as fact checkers when we, uh, when we deal in misinformation that comes from official bodies um, or that is you know, mentioned in parliament or by politicians. So there are sometimes reasons to distrust an official source of information if it's developed a bad reputation or if it hasn't been completely open with you about, uh, transparent with you about its methodology or about its sources. But there's obviously a, a big leap between mistrusting an official source and therefore believing that there must be something else um, at work. Um, because if the government says it isn't happening, you either treat it with some degree of caution or you actively disagree with it. And you think, OK, there therefore must be something going on because the government is saying it isn't. Um, so anyway, there's lots of lots of subtopics there, that, that, lots to talk about, lots to talk about. But I'll get in, in, in a moment to some specific examples of where we've seen this in the context of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but just before then, I have one final time I wanted to ask this question. Um, so when is my when is my birthday? So do any of you remember what the right answer is to that? because we, we had a little discussion earlier on as well. Um, so it's not, we established it's not today, February the 4th, February the 14th, <laughs> but I'm doubting that now too. Yes, I did mention earlier that it was Valentine's Day, um, two days ago, um, but I'm afraid that wasn't true either. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> There's no point in me now telling you when my birthday is, by the way, because there's no way any of you are going to believe it. So I'll maybe I'll maybe leave that to afterwards if any of you care. <laughs> but um, this this is a this is an old this is an old card anyway. Not that old. You can see that there's a there's a thing. It does say dear Joe in it. Um, but no, uh, it's not it's not um, it's not on Valentine's Day. Or at least since you won't believe me saying that anyway, you can't be certain that it was on Valentine's Day. And again, the reason that I bring this up is go back and again, think of that scale of naught to really surprised. Because um, before I'd, you know, I'd confounded some of your expectations by saying, oh, the birthday thing was the lie, even though I told you it wasn't. So how many of you had your expectations confounded again when I apparently, again, left character and said, oh, the actual truth is it was two days ago and I had to deal with this all my life and all that nonsense that I just talked. Um, again, did your guard, again, just, just fall a little bit because you made this assumption, you made this cognitive assumption of, oh, he's, he's leaving character. He's not doing the lie game anymore. This is true. Um, or, or, or were you, or did you now keep that vigilance up? I can guarantee <laughs> you're more surprised now, Ruth, I see. Um, I think though, if I tried this again, which I won't, there won't be any more of this in the presentation. And that is the truth. And that's, that's, a, that's a clearly testable truth because there won't be a slide like this again. Um, I think if I did this again, you'd be much, much more vigilant now because you wouldn't trust any kind of 
information that I gave you or any kind of moving out of character and saying, um, uh, and saying, oh, actually, this is the truth, that was a lie, and so forth. So again, the purpose of this, just self-reflect and think, if you're still surprised, what does that say about your vigilance and how reliable your vigilance is? Are there times in the day or your daily life when your vigilance is more vulnerable than at other times? And think about that, just have a little think. Um, so, <laughs> uh, I wish I, I really wish I'd started with a mask now, Ian. Um, so now I've got to get through the rest of the presentation somehow convincing you that the lie task is over. Um, so let's just see how that goes anyway. Um, let's look at some examples then of where we've been seeing conspiracy theories, particularly in the context of the pandemic. And I want to start with some lighthearted ones because not all conspiracy theories are particularly harmful. Um, so these are slightly more lighthearted examples. And they're all across on a different, on a similar theme, actually. So um, we've seen in the past year, uh, past two years, claims that Ipsos Mori, who did did some, um, I believe, some uh, track and track and track and trace work for the government. People noticed that Ipsos Mori in Latin translates as they die. Um, <laughs> um, so that became a claim that we had to debunk. And um, online translators, to be fair, if you type in Ipsos Mori, many of them, they can say they die as an answer, but it's, it's not proper Latin. So it's not actually what that it's not actually a kind of proper Latin phrase, so it wouldn't actually come up. And in any case, Ipsos Mori is called that because of two different organizations that, 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 that merged a long time ago. Um, so it's essentially a bit of an accident. It's not, not some idea that behind the scenes, it's all about they die. And by the way, if they were out to kill us all, would they really call themselves, <laughs> would they really call themselves something so checkable? that you can pop it into Google Translate. On the same, on the same vein, um, AstraZeneca um, translates as weapon that kills. And of course, AstraZeneca produced the Oxford vaccine um, for coronavirus. Um, again, you can, if you change languages each time, find a way that AstraZeneca looks like it says weapon that kills. Um, but you have to be very selective, and actually, Astra is the Greek for the star anyway. So it's it's not really a claim that stands up, but it comes from the same ilk of people who see something in plain sight. <coughs> and I mean, look at the phrase, wake up fools. You'll see something like this quite a lot. Something actually quite insulting, but it's people who believe they see more in plain sight than the rest of us do. In the same vein, the Greek letter delta is pyramid shaped. And the Phoenician letter for Omicron is uh, an I symbol. And of course, the symbol of the Illuminati that is, is often, I'm sure will be vaguely familiar to all of you, is the I inside the triangle. Um, and therefore, look at these two virulent strains of COVID-19. Um, and look at oh goodness me, <laughs> look at the uh, look at the different uh, look at this relationship we've got here. Um, all the so, three examples that I've just shown you, they come from the same ilk of theory about seeing something that is, in some ways, in plain sight, very easily searchable for, and then seeing okay, seeing the pattern as we looked at earlier, seeing the pattern in events, and seeing okay, this this is something part this is part of something bigger. Um, now getting more serious. So we've, this is a very recent example that we've seen in recent weeks and months. British government admitted vaccines have damaged the natural immune system of those who have been double vaccinated. Um, this comes in a, a basically a very general category of anti-vax misinformation, the kind of misinformation that we've seen a lot um, and that takes the form of Essentially, this life-saving vaccine that many of us need to need to have in order to tackle the COVID pandemic um, is actually going to cause you harm to your body, to yourself, to your health. And we've all seen this advertised very, very 
heavily. And it, it touches on conspiracy theories as well, because it, it relates to beliefs either in a group of scientists that are doing this deliberately as a means of control, or relating to the belief that COVID is actually a myth in itself, and that it's all been created um, with the pretense of uh, getting these vaccines into people that have other effects, for instance, and so on. Um, and more to do with pregnancy as well. So, for instance, data showing a 3,000% increase in the number of women who've lost their unborn child as a result of having the COVID vaccine. And that sparked an entire set of work that Full Fact does. We work with an organization called Pregnant Then Screwed, um, and they basically are a charity that supports women who are kind of pregnant and want access to good, reliable information. Um, and in particular, reliable information about what they're putting into their bodies and what the government is telling them to put into their bodies. Is this safe? Is this safe for their unborn children, etc.? So that sparks a huge suite of work that we've been doing over the last year on that as well. But one of the most um, long standing theories that we've looked at is the theory to do with 5G and where uh, where the 5G conspiracy theories come from. The 5G conspiracy theory goes looks goes like this. Um, it can take different forms, but essentially 5G and 5G masts are causing harmful health effects to the public, particularly those who live in rain in close range of one of these masts. Um, <clears throat> It can be related to cancer specifically, and it can be related to other illnesses as well, but largely the belief that 5G is causing that. Now, in part, what these conspiracy theories are based on is some true information, which is that forms of radio waves can be harmful to, to, um, to, uh, to, to humans and human tissues. Um, the fact is that 5G waves, the, the waves that they operate on, are a completely different end of the spectrum that aren't harmful. But nevertheless, that modicum of truth about, well, it's on, it's on the same spectrum, how do you know that they're not harmful? That's part of where it comes from. But the theories themselves develop much, much beyond that and develop, beyond, uh, develop into there are actors who are deliberately deploying these, these masks in order to spread these health problems. Um, what we found when we researched this two years ago is that 5G conspiracy theories didn't just pop up when 5G popped up. They're actually at least third or fourth generation um, of conspiracy theory about exactly the same topic. You could go back to 2005 and find articles from the BBC and so forth talking about the rollout of 3G and how people similarly believe that that might have harmful effects and go back to the early the early noughties even the late 90s and how many of you can remember the debate about mobile phones and use of mobile phones causing causing cancer and harmful effects um, this is this is a debate that has a very long a long life to it and that's what we found out to our fascination with this kind of theory was that it's not new it's it kind of takes on different forms in specifically, but there's a common narrative to all of these beliefs. And the, the common narrative to the 5G belief comes into this. Now its intersection with the COVID pandemic is really interesting on that basis, because while it's given in some ways people a reason to believe the 5G myth more, um, in other ways, it's, it's actually taken a different form. So for example, one of the forms that the COVID 5G um, crossover theory takes is that 5G is exacerbating the harmful effects of COVID, helping transmit it and so forth. Um, so COVID is part of the, 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 wider, uh, the wider idea by some elite to spread harmful, ha harmful, harmful things amongst the population and 5G is just another type of this. But another conspiracy theory that's prevalent at the moment, which we find really interesting that this is also out there, is that actually COVID isn't really a, a, isn't really a real thing. COVID is a myth. And that it's actually being used as a cover for 5G to be deployed en masse. 
And we saw this last year with a, a very viral video that went around. Um, and it was uh, of a, a lady who confronted two telecommunications engineers in the street. They were installing some um, fiber optic um, cables, I think. And she confronted them saying that these weren't safe. Why weren't they in lockdown like everyone else? Because I think it was locked down at the time. And what that played into in that situation was a belief that while the rest of us are being told to lock down because of this imaginary, uh, imaginary virus, engineers are being told across the country to, um, to put up these masks while everyone's locked in their houses. So you can see how that plays into a, a belief as well about the control, the control from the center and causing that kind of, um, causing that kind of behavior and that belief to take hold. So these are just some examples of what we've seen in actual UK public debate taking hold and what we've had to debunk as a fact-checking charity. Now, how does this differ from mainstream misinformation? Well, mainstream information actually takes on a fairly predictable set of characteristics. Um, all the kinds of mainstream mis misinformation that I've dealt with in 12 years of fact-checking probably fall into one of three categories. Either there's something wrong with the source, the claimant has misrepresented the source, or context is missing. So to give you an example of this, um, I, um, a, a, a really big fact check I did once was about a newspaper front page that claimed that 400 patients were being kicked out of hospital beds every night. Um, and um, uh, essentially because they, they were low priority and other people needed those beds. So that was the claim by the newspaper. And actually that, as it turned out, that claim touched on all three kinds of problem here. So the source itself that the, the newspaper got this claim from were hospital records where people had been discharged at midnight, essentially. Um, so uh, how many people have been kicked out between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m.? 400 a day. And that produced the headline. But it turned out that almost all the people that were kicked out happened to be kicked out at exactly midnight. This was what was in the record, 0000, zero, zero, zero as the time. And that was when they were kicked out of hospital. And we realized, actually, a lot of these people might never have left the hospital at that time at all. It's what happens is in those systems, if you don't fill in anything in the box, it just defaults. That's the default time, midnight. So we realized that actually behind this story, there's a completely misleading computer system that might be giving us completely false positives here. Um, but also the newspaper in question had misrepresented the source as well. This was a second type of problem. So rather than being kicked out, um, a lot of these discharges were for people who discharged themselves, for instance, because they didn't want to be in the hospital anymore. Were they kicked out? Probably not on that definition. And finally, context was missing. 400 were, you know, apparently left the hospital between those hours. How does that compare to the number that leave during the day? 10,000 leave during the day. How does 400 then look in the context of that? And is it the scale of issue that we should really be concerned about? Now, all kinds of mainstream information probably, when it comes down to it, fall into one of these three categories. And conspiracy theories don't because conspiracy theories almost never have a source. And if they do, um, the source is basically an untrust, untrustworthy piece of information anyway, that we wouldn't even fact check in a normal way. We would just say, well, it's basically unsubstantiated because the source can't even begin to explain this phenomenon like they say it is. Now, the final section of what I wanted to talk to you about is a little bit more positive because it's been a little bit, it can be a bit depressing to look at the kinds of harm that can come about because of these conspiracy beliefs. And I want to tell you some of the positives that came out of our research. And the main positive is we can change beliefs. We can change beliefs that lead to people sharing harmful information. I'm not saying that every single person who holds any kind of conspiracy belief that is something to be solved by the rest of us. No, not at all. What is to be solved is the spreading of harmful information that comes about from people who hold beliefs like this. We can change beliefs in three ways, according to our research. 
We can use corrections, inoculation, and critical thinking. Um, corrections are self-explanatory, probably. They involve exposing people to corrective information, which, by the way, has to take the format of explaining what is being corrected, so showing people an example of the misinformation, then providing a direct debunk, saying that that is wrong, and then, crucially, providing an alternative that is true. And research shows that if you don't actually combine all of those things, it really reduces or even completely nullifies the effect of a correction. That's why at Full Fact, as an organization, when we do our fact checks, we always provide a link to what we're checking. Um, and we always provide as much as we can of the alternative situation to what the misinformation is trying to tell you. Um, and we are often can't do that because there are often gaps in information. But in so far as we can, it's important to be able to put out on Twitter or Facebook, here's the true version of events, not this false thing that you might have seen before. Secondly, inoculation. Now, what this means in this context is doing prior work at uh, raising people's vigilance so that they're not caught out when something um, when something false does take place. So a really good example of this is Keir Starmer and Jimmy Savile, this claim that um, uh, Boris Johnson used in the House of Commons a few weeks ago that has got a lot of, of has caused a lot of outrage, really. And um, one interesting um, one, as one interesting aspect of that story in the news reports about it is that um, almost immediately after that claim was made, outlets such as the BBC and, and journalists on Twitter were instantly referring to past information saying, this has already been debunked. This is a known, a known conspiracy theory about Keir Starmer's connection to the Jimmy Savile case. It's already been debunked. And then the outrage kind of came very, very fast because people were already saying, hang on a minute, this is an established conspiracy theory that the prime minister is repeating in the Commons. That came about essentially because journalists and the public debate was already inoculated. Think of it as it had a vaccine a few years ago when Full Fact and many, many others debunked this claim um, when it was being made all the way back then. Those debunks exist on the internet and exist in the mind of political journalists. So when it gets made again, it's just like an immune system. It knows, it knows a bit about how to respond to this virus now, and it acts very quickly. Similarly, this claim happened again in the House of Commons. It had been dealt with many times before by fact checkers and others, and was instantly talked about in that context. Not everyone was perfect. Not everyone reported it as a, uh, some people simply just reported it as a disputed facts. Others were a little more forthright and, 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 and rightly so by saying, no, this has been established. This is not true. Um, so inoculation really helps because it helps true information come to the fore much more quickly and much more prominently, which is an important aspect to it. <clears throat> and finally, critical thinking and cultivated critical thinking. A little bit like what I tried to do at the start of today, making you think more vigilantly. <clears throat> and if we can encourage that more widely and encourage that via education and by institutions just like Newcastle, then we can start to have an impact as well, a kind of inoculation, again, in a generic way, it's kind of making people generally vigilant about information they may encounter. But there are caveats to all these, and I wouldn't be a good fact checker if I didn't tell you about these. So first of all, the format of corrections matters. Um, an open fact check of the kind that we do um, is, is fine and effective. But if you, for instance, decide to use redacted information, um, this, can, this can have an impact. So there is a, a, a famous conspiracy theory of a US plane, and I forget the, the name of the plane. There is a plane bound for Paris from um, the United States and went down in the ocean shortly after takeoff. And um, a lot of people, um, a lot of people didn't believe that this was just an accident. And some people looked at photographs of that accident afterwards, saw kind of flashes of light through the sky and thought, it's a, new, it's a US Navy missile. Something's gone 
catastrophically wrong with a missile test and the government are now covering it up because it's shot down a plane with lots of passengers on. Um, and a lot of the official information that came out afterwards about that plane and its accident contain redacted information for various for various reasons why those things have to be redacted. Um, but when people are presented with redacted information, if anything, it reinforces the original belief in the conspiracy, because why am I not being given this information? It goes back to that need for cognitive closure. If you see a gap in information, you need to fill it. And the easiest way to fill that in that context is, oh, this is the cover up that I'm talking about. This is why it's all blacked out. So redacted information can actually have a, a, a backfire effect effectively. Also the use of emotive imagery. So if you're telling people that a vaccine is safe, don't show them a picture of a child dying from COVID because they didn't get a vaccine. Show them, give them more straightforward version of facts because emotive imagery, again, rather than encouraging people to a different point of view, actually can reinforce those, those beliefs in those conspiracies. Also a caveat of our knowledge about this uh, and uh, the knowledge of, that we've gained through research, we don't know how much belief can change over time. So if you imagine someone seeing something that is false and then being corrected, studies may just say in the immediate aftermath, yeah, that correction had an impact, few people believed it. But very few studies are longitudinal in that they follow that person then a week later, a month later, a year later, do they still remember the information? Do they still remember the correction? What is their belief then? And finally, there's a long road between changing beliefs and influencing behavior. So studies have shown that if you talk to people about vaccines, for instance, and encourage people that vaccines are safe, some people within a study will say, yes, you've convinced me that vaccines are safe. But that doesn't follow through into higher numbers of people actually getting a vaccine. So actually going out and getting vaccinated is a different task and a more difficult one to simply getting someone to say in a research setting, oh yes, I, I don't believe that anymore because I've seen that. So there's something more to it really than just, just changing people's beliefs. Changing behaviors is another task. Now, what does it mean then for us when we are in contact with conspiracy theorists or people who hold those beliefs? Well, first of all, if you're in a public setting, um, never leave unsubstantiated theories unchallenged. Um, if it is unsubstantiated, you should mention it. You should ask someone. The burden of proof is on them, essentially. If they're going to say that everything you, you thought you knew about this issue is wrong, well, it's their job to tell you why and why all the sources that you rely on are not valid. But also ask yourself if and where every correction is worth publicizing because we do this as a charity. We have to make decisions about whether to, you know, to follow every little Facebook post that asserts every little thing, because the effect of publishing a fact check about it could increase, uh, could increase the circulation of the original claim. And if that gets shared more than the correction, then we're going, actually taking backward steps rather than forward steps. So if you're a publisher of information or you're a journalist, you've got to be actually quite careful about when you intervene, not just jumping on every little strange thing that's coming up through internet forum. And as I said before, don't use fear inducing materials if you're covering anti-vax. Don't use pictures of needles, don't use pictures of people dying from it. It's not as persuasive as you might think the evidence shows at persuading as a person for instance. In terms of prevention, the inoculation side. Remind public figures if you're in contact with them, if you go to hustings, if you um, get a chance to ask your MP a question, tone of public debate influences belief. We've seen this through international studies where countries with relatively stable, secure democratic systems that have high trust in institutions tend to have fewer people believing in conspiracies than regimes that have less trust, less established institutions. And also at times when public debate is particularly fractious, such as during elections or referendums, this could be a time when conspiracy beliefs can take hold as well. 
and the trust in those institutions is really, really pulling the strain. So really, lack of trust in public, in, in public authorities, in politicians, that's a, that's, a, that's a nurturing ground for belief in conspiracies. And encourage information gaps to be filled. So if we don't know how many people are here illegally as a result of immigration, are there ways that we could actually get some kind of sensible guess? Because if absolutely no one tries to estimate something like that, then come the next election, if someone claims there are 10 million people here illegally, what have we got to say as re in response? We can say, no, there's no best evidence for that. But have we got the alternative version at the end that says, actually, this is close to the truth? If we don't have that, then we're, then we're fighting a losing battle because we don't have all we need to produce an effective correction. And a little bit like what I've been doing, teach people how to defend themselves about conspiracy beliefs, exposing the tactics of conspiracy supporters and cultivate analytical thinking, a bit like what we're doing here as well. Now, finally, because I, I, I want to give time for questions. So this is the last bit I want to talk about, talking to a conspiracy supporter. So when I talk about this, I actually have some family members in mind um, of, of my own that sometimes I, I talk to and I believe I might be talking to someone who's, who's, who believes a lot, of, a lot of things about these things that I've been mentioning. And um, you might all have a friend or family member or a memory of an occasion when you've spoken to someone and thought, OK, how can I usefully contribute to this discussion? And, it, and should I? These are the things that we learn from research in this regard. So first of all, have and show empathy. Don't ridicule. Um, so <laughs> ridiculing someone saying someone is stupid for holding these beliefs. Not only is it unfair in many cases, it's also completely ineffective if you want to try and have a conversation, learn more about them, perhaps persuade them to a different point of view. Affirm critical thinking. Now, this is my favorite um, of these tips because what you will find often, and I find this when talking to the family member that I mentioned, is that People who hold these beliefs virulently, um, they also believe that they are engaging in critical thinking in order to hold the belief. So they are they are almost look. I've look. So my family member might say, "Look, Joe, I've read, I've read all these things that you haven't read, and most people haven't read, and I've been looking at what the government is saying me, and I've been using my head, and I don't think they're trustworthy because of this, this, and this, and then, and then." the beliefs come from that. So actually, I think it, it, uh, the research shows it's helpful to affirm that critical thinking by saying, well, we believe in critical thinking too. So we both want to, we both want to work through this. Let's start with that as a, as a basis for what we have in common. We both believe in critical thinking. Then let's, let's do this methodically. Let's try and find, for instance, a common source. Um, and a great example of a common source that you might find is people who used to hold the conspiracy belief but no longer do. So that would be really interesting to explore with them. Okay, is, what do you think of this person then who, who used to believe that but has changed their mind? Now, I'm not saying that these tactics will have a high rate of success, particularly if your mission is to completely persuade someone to be a different person. I don't think that's going to happen vast majority of the time but these are guidelines that we think it's important people to have people to have so they have a basis for having a conversation because we should engage as much as we can rather than ignore um because it's important to do that in our democracy as well if not if for no other reason now um <laughs> that is the end of the presentation so you can now be reassured i'm not going to ask you any more questions about my birth date or anything like that. <laughs> um, and now that effectively the presentation is over, I will reassure you that there were no more intentional lies than the ones I told you about my birthday. I hope you can believe me now that I've finished that that is true. So um, I hope you found it useful what we discussed. And I'm really looking forward to answering your questions as well now. Now I've got some time and a bit of time to breathe. 
Um, so thank you for your time anyway. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. That that was that was terrific. Um, and just while people maybe, if you want to put your questions into the chat, now's a good time to do that, and then I'll put those questions to Joe or questions or maybe comments or experiences perhaps if you want to just um put those in either in everyday life or maybe in your role as a journalist um if you want to just type that into the chat um it just it just strikes me joe what you're saying there at the end perhaps we may not be able to bring many um people around to a different way of thinking but i guess you know at the very least by challenging by showing empathy uh, by affirming critical thinking, we can maybe at least persuade them not to maybe share the theory with others, or maybe just to maybe hold back from 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 doing that. Because I guess uh, that that's you know that's a harm, an, an extra harm that at the very least we can perhaps prevent from from happening. Um, so uh, thank you. Any any questions for Joe? So um, Phoebe's saying, thank you, Joe, um, engaging and helpful. Uh, I wonder if you had any advice on how to include fact checking in a job application. I pride myself on being annoying, difficult and checking almost every fact I write, but find it difficult to express that on a CV cover letter. I don't know, Phoebe, if you're applying for a job with full fact or an organization like, like that, but um, just in general, Joe, um, how, how do you describe this sort of attribute for being attentive to detail for checking facts. I mean, is it is it um, is that something you've ever ever needed to do or, or thought about or? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a really interesting question actually. I I, I think I think I mean I'm, it's a it's a term I've been using throughout the presentation actually. But I think um, if I were to if I were to say break down fact checking as a formula of skills, I'd say it's it's about um, critical thinking mixed with research methods. So you're demonstrating critical thinking by engaging critically with the news that you see every day and, and, and thinking about the caveats that might be behind it. And you're engaging in research methods when you pick up your keyboard and start actually going to sources and determining whether or not they're trustworthy or not. Um, so if you were say putting that in a job application, then I would definitely, I would, I would basically say, because it's not, it doesn't come under like job experience or or, uh, or education, but it does come under something you might say about your skills profile. And you say, I develop my skills every day as an active citizen, and my citizenship skills are, I I think critically about the information that I see, and I employ research methods every day in researching these stories. So I put them to the fore and, and show that you're an active citizen. It's certainly something that impresses us at full fact to see evidence that people don't just live in their jobs and, and whatever their education was, that they, they do something with their time that shows that they're engaged in their, their own community and their own country. Because that's what we do as fact checkers. We're all minded to make this country a better place, as I'm sure Phoebe is as well. Um, so I think brandish that and don't be ashamed of that, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, okay, just a couple of comments here. So Ruth is saying that was great, really useful. I'll especially keep it in mind while writing and for myself uh, in terms of staying vigilant. Uh, but I definitely wish it were easier to do in person. I think, I think Ruth, uh, yes. Um, she's saying difficult to challenge some of these beliefs and people who hold these beliefs when we're face to face with them as opposed to writing uh, you know a story that 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 sets the record straight as it were um so yeah i guess i mean it, that's just the nature of the beast isn't it i guess being difficult to see someone face to face and 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 challenge people uh, that's always going to be more difficult um let me see what else uh, joe what does joe think of QAnon? um oh yeah <laughs> that, i guess that's a whole <coughs> different order of 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 conspiracy theorism isn't it yeah and it's um it's not something that i can speak to a great deal of personal experience in in dealing with actually i, I um i have a, a number of colleagues who, who who know a lot more about that than i do so i don't want to to speak beyond my station um but it's i think it's um it's 
it's one of the most, it's one of the least accessible forms of theory to to accept actually because a lot of the things that i focused on things to do with vaccine hesitancy or 5g concerns they base themselves off what fundamentally are legitimate health concerns people have people should be concerned about what they put into their bodies and people should be concerned about whether people are potentially being killed in their community um, the kind of theories that are spread by QAnon and, and things like that seem much more divorced from that legitimate reality that people have concerns about and so I think people find it more difficult to understand um, and that's certainly all I can say because as I said I, I need to be more involved in that side of our research to know more. Um, sure, sure, no thank you. Um, Elizabeth just comments, uh, a lot of conspiracies rely on the, the idea that those who don't believe are going to mock those who hold the belief. So I think she's just endorsing what you're saying there in terms of the approach and not ridiculing people. Um, uh, Gabby, uh, it is easy to debunk the most absurd conspiracy theories when talking to people, but I find it so much more difficult to dispute misinformation that uses more intellectual language to appear to more educated people and have ju has just enough facts to sound true but mm. twisted around in the, in the misinformation how, how should we deal with with that yeah that's a really really good question and i find that difficult too <laughs> and i also find it much more difficult to um when i'm doing fact checking to do, if if um so there are some sources for instance that are obviously untrustworthy because they just don't put an effort into appearing otherwise um, it's the ones that that use that publish research papers and well cited research papers and that have actual people they can name scientists they can name who support their view um, and and that they can just litter their work with that and it, I've, I've seen it as well with um, um, I think it, what was it? It, it there's a strat there's a name for the strategy I think it, it's almost like the expert dump strategy where you can you can say hold a, a belief that is that is based off of conspiracy, perhaps that climate change isn't real or isn't isn't man made, and you can probably find five thousand so called experts across the world who'll sign their name to it, and they might just be people with with science degrees or something, not not climate scientists or any relevant expert, but they brandish that apparent expertise in front of you as a means of carrying you into accepting it because oh experts they must they must have a basis for saying that what i would say in terms of advice when dealing with that is first of all don't feel a personal obligation to respond if you're not if you're not sufficiently equipped to know oh well that's not a real expert because of x y and z you're not no one's expecting you to you know, represent all like-minded intelligent non-conspiracy believing people in this conversation that you're having with this conspiracy supporter. Um, so I wouldn't, first of all, feel any pressure to engage if you don't feel comfortable doing so. What most of us do actually, and uh, what most of us do, so take climate change. What do most of us do when we decide what we believe about climate change? We don't go and read research papers. We accept um, that we accept the position that other people take. So I don't know that much personally about how to measure climate change and, and how to measure the causal effects of climate change. What I do know is who I trust. And I trust a set of experts that are recognized, or I trust a set of um, media commentators or journalists who I trust to find the right expert. And trust is everything. So what I would do, I would just go back to what do you trust personally? And don't worry about engaging with what, whatever source this other person is providing with you, because there's just no way you can have a productive conversation if you're not comfortable. Go back to what you trust in your own time and use that as the basis for your beliefs and look, look more into it if you want to, but there's no obligation to do so. Well, thank you. Well, just a couple of final comments. And I'm sorry, folks, I might have to conflate some of your points here, but there's two or three just about, well, you know, what news sources, what sources, official sources can we trust? Uh, what do you trust, Joe? Um, and, and, you know, how, how, do, how do we make that decision about what sources are trustworthy and which ones aren't? 
Um, well, there's actually, there's almost like a bullet point answer to that question because um, in a, uh, the question is, can I, I, can I find the bullet points? Because I'm trying to remember. There are, I think I remember, I think I can remember. Um, so this is a really good take home, three ways to decide whether a source is trustworthy. First of all, um, look at reputation. So does the source have a reputation? Is it cited by major broadcasters? Has it been cited a long time? Does it have academic citations? Is it something that you recognize? Is it even got that recognition? Recognition reputation matter a great deal. Um, secondly, the transparency, not only of its sources, does it actually have the citations in there, but also of its funding and its funding structure. Um, and that, that actually overlaps the third thing, which is um, what are the safeguards in place in this source that make it independent? So for instance, if it's a charity, look at its trustees, the board of trustees, does it look like a reasonably balanced board of trustees with different, different influences in there? Um, is there a process that they publish about how they check the information? Do they peer review? Do they, do they, you know, do they have an independent complaints process if you've got a problem with what they've done? So look for safeguards on independence, look for the transparency of source and funding and look at reputation. And those are the three really, really key things that matter uh, when you're trying to determine that. And you won't always get it right, but that's a really good starting point, I think, of, of working it out. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you, Joe. And then I just, I think the final point really is a couple of people are making are not every conspiracy is just a theory conspiracies do actually sometimes exist so hmm. elizabeth is saying here um how do you deal with things that sound like conspiracies but are actually backed up with evidence it is true unfortunately that some governments and some companies can do bad things and of course you know journalists are often at the heart of discovering that and we can think of many films you know, whether it's Spotlight or, or others that, that, you know, have actually uncovered um, cover-ups and the like. So, you know, what are we to do in terms of making sure that we don't completely just write off everything, I guess, as a, as a, a dangerous theory? Well, um, <clears throat> good question again. Um, I, and I, 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 it's probably remiss of me actually not to mention at some point in the presentation that there are some things that you could call conspiracy theories that turned out to be true. The ones that spring to mind, um, things about US, um, uh, in the US, I think during prohibition in the 19 teens or 20s, um, the, the US, uh, delib the, the government deliberately, um, uh, I think they might have, might have manipulated, oh, what is it now? They did something. I think they, they might have manipulated, they might have, Oh, okay. I'll I'll come back to that one. The other one is the. the, the do you do you know Ian? I don't know if you know that than me. No, I don't. I don't know what you're hinting at in particular. There, Joe. No, sorry. That's all right. Um, but um, uh, oh, there we go. See, see, I'm a fact checker. I can find information quickly. Um, the government, the U.S. government, poisoned alcohol during the 1920s prohibition. That is a proven fact. Um, and. Some people are still surprised to hear that now, but there were cases where alcohol was poisoned to assist the prohibition of alcohol. Um, but more recently, um, the when a, a 2012 in investigation found that major international banks had manipulated what's called the, the LIBOR rate, uh, the in, interbank offered rate for profit. Um, they did that. That's an proven thing. And some people might assume that kind of bank collusion was exactly in the category of conspiracy theories that we've been talking about. So they do exist. How do you handle them? Well, or how do you distinguish between how do you just, what yeah. is? Yeah. Well, um, in some ways, they are they're almost impossible to distinguish when they first take hold. For instance, the belief that um, uh, that COVID-19 started in a lab. Um, that started off as a, as a counter, a counter current of in, information from the mainstream, which was, you know, this, this came from, um, this came from 
it is a mutation of something that was uh, affecting animals or something. And uh, so it was a counter stream which played directly into people's beliefs that there's a there are people trying to manipulate the world here and they did it in a lab. And that got debunked quite quickly because it, there was no evidence for it and it was it was counter. Then I think there was, I think about a year ago, there was a slight resurgence of that and the slight possibility that there might have been something to it, I believe. Some sources just suggested that, oh, hang on a minute, maybe there is some lab, lab basis for this. Now, I, I understand that's been debunked as well, but that's one thing that's simmering. And how do you tell them apart? I suppose it has to go back to the modicum of evidence. If you've got direct contrary evidence, like a major, you know, a major death that's taken place, for instance, there's been a coroner's report, there's been a lot of investigation, years of investigation by investigative journalists. How could anything new come out about Diana, for instance? I, I, I don't see it. Um, it's an ongoing pandemic, so I suppose facts that we think we know about coronavirus, maybe some of them still aren't completely solidified if we don't have all the information. So maybe just being aware of there are still gaps in information, even about things we think we know, and, and working off that. But it's very difficult, obviously. It's very difficult to know what might end up turning out to be true or not.